Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here on, on this wonderful Saturday uh, here in Boston. And we always welcome everyone back here. And uh, this morning, we, we're going to hear our distinguished professors uh, at Sloan, uh, Professor Les Recep Levy and Karen Zen. Please um, welcome them for our speech. So uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you uh, for um, taking the time to listen to us today. Um, I just arrived two days ago from Israel. And uh, this morning, when I kind of experienced the weather, uh, I thought to myself that I reminded myself um, something that people told me um, in 2006 when I arrived to Boston. Uh, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. It will change. Uh, <laughs> Now, uh, I see so many familiar faces uh, that keep coming back. Uh, so I guess it's not because of the weather, because it's something else. But thank you for coming back again and again and, and uh, engage with us. Um, today, uh, I have the pleasure to talk to you about a body of work that is, uh, has been conducted by multiple faculty uh, at the school and at MIT, more broadly speaking, uh, that is concerned with uh, food and agriculture systems and how you can innovate in this space with uh, analytics, uh, specifically supply chain analytics and sensing. And I have the pleasure to uh, uh, talk today together with uh, my colleague, my collaborator, my friend, <laughs> and someone I've learned a, a lot from, Karen Jiang. So you want to introduce yourself just a bit? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed this reunion weekend. Um, Really super excited to be here and speaking with you today. Uh, so I'm a faculty member in the operations management group at Sloan, and um, my research is uh, broadly defined in sustainable supply chains, and in the past uh, seven years or so, with a particular focus on food and agricultural systems. And I uh, have had the pleasure of working with Recep on uh, a number of uh, uh, research projects, which we hope to share with you today. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. OK, so let's get, get started. So what, what, I'm, what we are hoping to accomplish today is to start with a quick motivation uh, of why do we think that this area of food and agriculture systems and water systems is so important to the world. Uh, we're going to uh, try to not only introduce the work we have been doing, but also uh, talk a little bit about an initiative that we have in the school uh, around this, these topics. And hopefully, um, it will be interesting and inspiring um, and uh, make you um, want to know more about these issues. Uh, we're going to give you a glimpse of a few examples, uh, definitely not uh, comprehensive of everything that has been done uh, in this space. So just a few numbers to motivate why I would like to argue that if you think about most, if not all, the global societal problems that we are facing in the world these days, they all connect in a very direct manner to food, agriculture, and water systems. And I'm going to start with the most basic need. Uh, we all need to eat in order to live. Um, and unfortunately, um, we should expect a growing demand for food, because the population in the world, fortunately, is increasing. Uh, and it's not only the population that is increasing, but also the uh, diet habits are, are changing. And there is more and more demand for protein, for example. Uh, but um, frankly speaking, even today, we have millions of people that live under hunger in the world. So food security is by far not something uh, trivial. But if you have the sense that this is just a matter of a problem that is just a matter of developing countries, in fact, when you expand the definition of food security to nutritional security, namely the access to healthy food, to fruit and vegetables, then uh, even in the US, there are tens of millions of people that live in what we call food deserts. These are uh, uh, poor neighborhoods that don't have physical access to healthy food. So this is not just a problem of developing countries. This is a problem of basically every country, uh, including the US. Um, so the other issue that is related to food and that has a tremendous impact on human health is the issue around food safety and food contamination. 
it's, it's striking to know that this is one of the most significant reasons of illness and deaths in the world. Hundreds of thousands of cases. Most of them are actually children, or many of them are children, that are being uh, harmed by contaminated food and water. Um, there is a very complex interaction between agriculture and food systems and the environment. I mean, naturally, the environment is impacting uh, agriculture systems, uh, their productivity. And, um, and at the same time, agriculture systems have major footprint, a major impact on the environment, both in terms of um, uh, gas emission, but also, and even more importantly, in terms of soil pollution, air pollution, and water pollution. But this is going even beyond that. Um, agriculture, the agriculture sectors in the US uh, employs about 1% of the uh, workforce. Uh, but in some countries, like India, like China, like other developing countries, the agriculture sector, in fact, employs significant fraction of the workforce. In India, it's something close to 60%. In Indonesia, it's something uh, over 50%. Um, so just going back here, so in many countries, food systems are not just uh, um, um, important in the context of providing the most necessary uh, need of humans. Uh, it's also about uh, providing the, uh, uh, securing the welfare of these uh, em empl uh, employers or people, especially farmers, that are engaged in this sector or work in this sector. So our initiative, uh, uh, here at MIT Sloan, we started it a few years ago. It's called the Food uh, Supply Chain Analytics uh, and Sensing. And uh, it's very unique in the sense that it really engages multiple faculty from many, many disciplines. Uh, and also not fa only faculty from uh, the School of Management here at Sloan, but also from, the other, uh, from two other major schools at the MIT, the School of Engineering and the School of Sciences. Uh, we have a broad set, uh, range of expertise uh, spanning supply chain analytics, uh, artificial intelligence, um, uh, food science, regulatory science, economics, uh, and more. And I'm very, very fortunate and proud to be uh, able to collaborate with all of these faculty, as you can see here. So talking a little bit about the work we've been doing at EFSAS, our initiative, it has three major pillars of work. Um, the first of which is really thinking about uh, how to use analytics to optimize uh, agriculture and food systems, having in mind particularly the welfare of consumers and farmers. <clears throat> and the reason is that when you think about most of these supply chains, they are very complex, but most of the issues are being determined at the very upstream parts of the supply chain, namely the farming parts. All the safety issues, or most of the safety issues are originated there. The productivity is originated there. And unfortunately, in most countries, farmers struggle to actually uh, maintain their welfare. So we believe that this is a major priority to actually think about how we can help these farmers to be more productive and have better welfare, because that's going to improve the entire system. Food and agriculture supply chains have major impact on human health, both positive and negative. There are many health threats, many of the most significant human health threats, the threats to human health, emerge from food and agriculture supply chains. Food safety is one of them, but if you think about the last several decades, we had multiple outbreaks of viruses that emerged from animals from agriculture supply chains, through agriculture supply chains emerge from animals, um, SARS, avian flu, and others. These are just examples of that. There, are, uh, there is impact on antimicrobial resistance. So the, the range of uh, threats that emerge from uh, agriculture supply chains to human health, as well as the opportunity, is really tremendous. So that's another area of focus for us. And then finally, we have a body of work that is really focused on issues related to access to food. And in that context, I would like to uh, really highlight the fact that um, 
we have really a striking contradiction between uh, uh, the fact that we have a lot of people that don't have appropriate access to food and the fact that food supply chains are perhaps one of the most wasteful supply chains that we have. I mean, the estimate is currently that between 30 to 70% of the production of these uh, supply chains is not being consumed. So it's not only not being consumed, it actually has uh, at the same time also impact on the environment because uh, you have a lot of uh, waste that you uh, need to handle. So a lot of challenges. And what I would like to do next is to give you a few examples of some of the work we've been doing around the world, uh, in China, in India, in, in, in other countries, and in the US uh, around some of these issues. And I'm going to start with uh, some uh, major project that we had over the last six years, over six years, in China. Uh, these are some of the people that are involved. Um, and perhaps one of the most exciting parts of this uh, project, and that's going to be a theme that you will see throughout the examples that we're going to talk about today, is the fact that these are really not only uh, collaborative work within MIT, something that engages, a project that engages multiple faculty from three schools of MIT, but it's also an international collaboration. Uh, in fact, as part of this project, we are collaborating with five Chinese universities, uh, companies, and institutions uh, that never worked together uh, before working with MIT. So MIT is facilitating collaboration, not only between MIT and other organizations, but also across organizations in China. Uh, this is a project that is, uh, is funded by, primarily by the Walmart Foundation, who gave us several years ago uh, a significant uh, budget to launch it. Um, and w over the years, uh, you can see, I mean, COVID clearly disrupted that. But uh, as you can see from these pictures, this is very much MIT going on the ground and really uh, looking at these problems where they, uh, where they exist, working with the local academics and industry partners to develop an understanding of the problems as well as solution approaches. So you can see here, here participating in, in, in conferences. Uh, you can see us here in horses markets in China. I'm gonna talk more about that. And here on the right hand side down here, uh, this is a research collaboration meeting with 40 people in China uh, with our students and faculty, uh, collaborating with students and faculty in China. Um, in spite of all the political tension, uh, in spite of all the turmoils that we have seen, uh, the friendships uh, sustain that, the collaborations sustain that, uh, and still exist even during the COVID pandemic. Uh, we, we maintain that over Zoom. So let me show you a few examples of the work we've been doing as part of this effort. And this is going to be focused on food safety. And um, uh, you might be surprised, but in China, there is a law that mandates the regulatory agencies in China to post all the tests conducted on food products in the public domain. What is the challenge? <clears throat> the challenge is that the regulatory environment in China is highly fragmented. And um, this, data, this data reside on multiple websites. There is a state website, as you see here on the left, uh, that is relatively more structured. But then for each prefecture city, for each province in China, there is a specialized or dedicated website on which they post their own te test records in very ad hoc formats, mostly unstructured text, and so forth and so forth. So at, the given, at this state, these, these data is not, are not very useful because you cannot really integrate them. And if you think that that's just a China problem, I can tell you from working with the FDA here in the US that they have not this particular problem, but data integration is a major problem for these agencies. So this is what we were able to do with a team of one or two people leveraging at scale machine learning and text analytics. We are able to scrape on a regular basis most of these websites and unify them into one scheme, one structured scheme. Uh, and at the moment, we have close to 11 million records. This is a data set that is very unique. We have created it. We, have up, we are updating it on a regular basis. And we are going to open it to the academic community to be able to conduct research in, these, uh, in this area. So let me just give you a few uh, examples of what you can do once you are able to create useful data, which I would argue 
I know that the previous said, uh, meeting was about data. I would argue that creating useful data is sometimes the most significant challenge to be able to use analytics to inform decisions. So <clears throat> this is an example of a supply chain in China. It's the supply chain of uh, uh, freshwater grown uh, aquatics, uh, one of the high risk uh, product categories in China in terms of food safety, because a lot of it is being sold alive. Uh, and as you can see here, it starts from the left with the farming part. And the farming, the farming in China, like many other developing countries, is very different than the farming in the US. The, the farming in the US is mostly based or relies on large-scale industrial farms. That's by no means uh, the situation in China and other developing countries that really uh, have farms that are mostly small, household farms, family-based farms, uh, millions of farms. And these farms produce uh, small-scale quantities and then distribute them through a network of brokers <coughs> through uh, these wholesale markets that you can see here in the middle, which is, again, a unique uh, aspect of the supply chain, uh, agriculture supply chain or food system in China and other developing countries. These are large distribution centers that then from them it goes either to retail stores and restaurants. These are things that we know uh, exist also here in the, in, in the West, but also to what we call secondary wet markets that in China are still uh, the major outlet uh, in which most Chinese uh, do their grocery, grocery shopping. And the China FDA, the regulatory agency that is responsible to regulate this system, uh, conduct tests, as I mentioned, they, they conduct tests and, and try to basically regulate this system. And they tend to actually conduct most of the tests at retailer stores. So the question that we would like, uh, we wanted to ask is not where the test is conducted, but rather than where in the supply chain the risk is introduced. So think about a food product test that failed the, to pass the test at a retail store in China. What we would like to understand is where that risk was introduced. So for example, if uh, what was detected was a residue, residue of uh, illegal antibiotics, that's likely to be introduced at the farm level, right? If it's a preservative, it's likely to be introduced at the manufacturer uh, level, level and so forth. So what we were trying to do is to analyze the source of the risk by basically, in an automated way, be able to take all the failed records in retail stores in China and based on text analytics understand what is the likely source of them. And when we did this analysis, we found out that 8% of the risk arrives from the uh, environment, about 40% comes from farming practices, 46% comes from manufacturing practices, and the rest is coming from the transportation part. And this already provides major insight, okay? Why is it um, providing major insight? Because it tells you that the current policy of testing of the China regulatory, uh, Chinese regulatory agencies is not testing at the source of the risk. The source of the risk is not the retailer stores. Most of the tests are being conducted at the retailer stores, but not at the source of the risk. So that's already calls for a strategic shift in their mindset in terms of where they should test. And what we were able to do is to take it a step further. We were able to essentially operationalize this insight and create an interactive tool that basically highlights high-risk manufacturers. What are high-risk manufacturers? These are manufacturers that their products failed at the test in the retailer store because of a reason likely to be attributed to their own practices. And when you actually look on those type of uh, high-risk manufacturers, you see that the tests on, those, on the sites of those manufacturers have a much higher failure rate than when you compare it to any manufacturer. So this immediately gives you something very, very strategic, the ability to do what we call risk-based sampling, risk-based regulatory activity that really goes after the higher risk entities and in fact is able to use the same level of resources that is very scarce to detect a much a higher fraction of the problems in the supply chain and eliminate them at the source. So going back to this picture, I want to go back to these hostess markets that are really unique, as I mentioned, they're they are, they are unique. They, they, in fact, when you look on the distribution uh, and the supply chain, uh, the food supply chain in China, uh, there are millions of farms and there are millions of retailer stores and, and restaurants 
but they are relatively very small, about 5,000 uh, horses markets that are basically consolidating the distribution of about 80% of the supply of many important product categories, including fruits, vegetables, and also aquatic products. So that that's actually poses a very, very um, unique opportunities. Because if you think about a gigantic place like China, if you tell me that there are 5,000 locations in which I can monitor and regulate 80% of the supply, that's an opportunity. And unfortunately, that's an opportunity that the uh, um, current uh, uh, policy does not exploit. Because as I mentioned before, they don't test in horses markets. Now, again, how do you do risk-based sampling? <clears throat> what we were able to do, again, using uh, text analytics, we were able to also do uh, or create risk scores for all the horses and wet markets in China by basically being able to identify all the test records of products that were tested on these markets or were sourced from those markets and look on the failure rate of each market and use that as a proxy to actually capture the risk. And again, this is an interactive tool that we developed with our um, collaborators to allow, uh, take these analytics insights and convert them to actual decision support tools. So these are real, real you know, this is a picture, but the, there is actually an interactive tool that you can ask questions and actually uh, search. Now, when you think about horses markets, <clears throat> this is not just about analytics. This is also about the ability to test in this very, very non-trivial setting. And why horses markets are a non-trivial setting to test? At least for two reasons. One of them is the food is moving very quickly through these sites. So you need something rapid. Secondly, you also need something that will give you actionable regulatory uh, 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 signal, which it's not only about, hey, there is a residue of antibiotics in this food product, but also the quantity. You need something quantitative. The, the challenge is that the current testing technologies are either rapid and very inaccurate or lab-based that uh, give you a more accurate signal but takes maybe a three or four days, five days. By that time, the food is not there, right? So we have a team that has been working. This is the collaboration that we have with the uh, engineering and, uh, school and the School of Sciences to develop a new generation of technolo uh, technology that is able not only to rapidly test uh, and give you quantitative lab-based quality signal, but also do that in a multiplexed way, namely that with one test, you are able to test for many aldetrans, many potential contaminants. And, the, and why that is important, because when you think about food supply chains, it's very, very hard to know what the contaminant is going to be. And most of the current technologies really requires you to prescribe in advance what are you looking for. And if there's something that you're not looking for, you're going to miss it. Okay? So this is another element of the systematic approach that we are trying to establish here. <clears throat> I mentioned zoonotic diseases. So again, what are zoonotic diseases? These are viruses that jump from animals to humans. And if they become human to human infectious, then we have a problem. As you know, we did have a few problems with zoonotic viruses over the last several years and decades. Um, and uh, you know, surprisingly, many of these past outbreaks are associated with horses markets in China. So the question that we wanted to ask is, OK, is there some connection between food safety risks that emerge from these uh, horses markets and zoonotic disease risks that emerge from these markets? And what was striking when we started to look at this was that when you sampled the farms around these markets that supply these markets and the markets, you often found that there is almost no positive tests in the farms surrounding the market. And at the same time, a lot of positive tests for zoonotic viruses uh, in the market itself. So the markets seem to play a role of amplification of the infections. I'm talking here as, on avian flu as, a, uh, as one example. Avian flu is something that comes from chicken. Uh, and what we did here is to develop a model that will allow us to understand why the horses markets and the wet markets play a role. Uh, and, the, and the idea here is that uh, you need to develop a, an understanding that infections occur not only between individuals, 
We know that. That's something that is very commonly captured by current epidemiology models, but also between these birds and the environment. So the environment is uh, receiving infections from the infected uh, birds that shed infections uh, or virus into the environment, and then this, th these viruses are being preserved in the environment and then can infect healthy uh, birds that are going through the market. And when you do let this go iter iteratively, you actually get an increased infectivity in the market as well as increased uh, infectivity among the individuals. And that's kind of a new epidemiological model that we created to explain that. But it also gives you an immediate insight that basically the, the practices that you have in the market are going to be very, very important to understand how you control these uh, bad cycle, right? And in order to understand this better, we are now in the midst of launching a, another field survey in China in which our collaborators in China are going to survey uh, live chicken markets uh, and really understand the goal here is to try and understand how the outlets of the market, the practices of the market are correlated to the micro understanding of the in, 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 uh, and how infection spreads within the market. This is very exciting. We are looking forward to see the results and uh, further develop our understanding. So these are our collaborators going and serving markets in China. Um, another thing that we are trying to launch soon is to try and understand how these markets can give us a signal about antimicrobial resistance. That's a major problem. I don't know if you know, but most of the superbugs uh, and the uh, resistance to antibiotics is coming from agriculture supply chains. That's also true for the US. Uh, in fact, agriculture supply chains is the place where you use the most antibiotics, uh, much more from, than from human, for human, uh, surprisingly. So that's going to be something very, very important that we hope to pursue in the near future. And uh, before I conclude my part of the uh, conversation, I just want to say that the China government uh, over the last several years uh, published a, a few recommendations and direction, directions that they would like to pursue, and they seem to very much fit our own uh, um, direction's priorities, so there seem to be an alignment there in terms of um, where China is going to take it, and hopefully our work will inform that. So just to conclude, um, hopefully I gave you an example of uh, something that is very, very uh, uh, impactful in China. But most of the principles that I talked about, specifically risk-based sam uh, sampling, a risk-based regulatory work, is something completely transferable to other settings. And in fact, our starting point was, in fact, a, a work with the, with the US FDA that we've done. This was our first project in which we, we actually uh, um, developed very different tools, but along the lines of being able to inform the, scarce, the, the allocation of these scarce regulatory resources in a much more strategic way uh, using data, using better sensing, and advanced analytics. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Karen. Great. Thank you, Ressa. Thank you. Uh, so next, I'm going to share with you a few uh, projects that uh, we have been conducting in two other countries, India and Indonesia. Um, so uh, in the, the projects that I'm going to share uh, focus a bit even more on the upstream of the, the supply chain, which is the production or the producers uh, in these countries. So to give a bit more context, uh, let me first share with you some of the characteristics and challenges that we have observed through our research about these supply chains, especially the first mile uh, in these countries. So typically these supply chains in the very upstream are composed of a very large number of smallholder producers. Uh, these producers, they are located you know, in a very distributed geography, uh, oftentimes very resource constrained, and also do not have a lot of access to markets, to information to help them with their decisions. And at the same time, they are really relying on a very opaque network of middlemen uh, to sell their products, to make a living, and to sustain their uh, livelihoods and their, and their families. And then uh, the, uh, after the, you know, going through this opaque network of middlemen, the food, the, the products and commodities eventually reach to you know, larger scale processors, manufacturers, and eventually to retail uh, markets, both um, in global as, globally as well as locally. 
I think as, as Russ have mentioned earlier, uh, these smallholder producers, despite that each individual producer is very resource constrained and oftentimes has a very small land holding, collectively they are actually the major production uh, source of these supply chains. And um, they, you know, uh, also account for a major fraction of the local economy in terms of workforce. For example, here are uh, numbers in, um, in India uh, from their census and over half of their workforce is actually employed in the uh, agricultural space. Now, this very, very fragmented uh, as well as opaque supply chain can impose uh, quite a bit of challenges. Um, to reiterate, I think some of these that have been pointed out earlier, first of all, on the upstream, these, um, there are data showing that in developing countries, these smallholder producers suffer from low productivity, uh, in part because they lack resources, lack access to information and technology. Um, and then, of course, uh, there's high poverty among these smallholder producers. So recent data from the World Bank shows that 78% of the world's poorest population is actually uh, smallholder uh, farmers in developing countries. And then, uh, as you have heard in the first part of the talk, uh, a lot of the food safety and food security issues are related to the upstream, the very first mile of agricultural supply chains that uh, are you know, composed of these smallholder producers. And finally, uh, I don't think I have to say too much on it. I think a lot of us are very familiar that these uh, smallholder supply chains are also oftentimes coexist with some of the most threatened landscapes. For example, tropical rainforest and how you know, practices of uh, these supply chains oftentimes could threaten you know, environmental to sustainability through things like uh, deforestation. So uh, to summarize all of this, we believe that you know, addressing farmers' welfare is a key, uh, uh, is a key uh, aspect to address uh, these challenges. And countries around the world realize that and have made a lot of significant investment, in particular in recent, recent years, in terms of deploying, developing and deploying digital technologies such as platforms uh, and, and, and other mobile uh, technologies to help improve both market and information access for these uh, smallholder producers to empower them for better decision making. Now the question is, you know, are they achieving the potential that these technologies you know, are expected to achieve? And if not, or if uh, we identify situations when they are not really realizing their full potential, are there, what can we do? Right? What can we do to bring the full potential to really help improve uh, welfare in the upstream? And so that is really um, you know, the overarching goal that we would like to uh, achieve in this research program. So uh, in, the past, in, in the past five to six years, uh, we have particularly focused in India and have been working with a number of local organizations from government, from, from government to uh, nonprofit organizations to, private, uh, to the private sector uh, to really try to think about interventions to improve efficiency and social welfare in this uh, uh, food and ag system in the country. Uh, so next, I'm going to share with you some of these research projects. and definitely happy to chat more uh, afterward. Um, just as how we did our research in China, this is also a research that is very, very field based and on the ground. Uh, I personally have made, you know, more than seven uh, visits before the pandemic uh, to India, uh, a meeting with our collaborators, and more importantly, really meeting with the um, uh, participants in the agricultural supply chains. These include farmers, include the traders, the middlemen, the commission agents, and also market officials that organize agricultural markets in the country. And I would say that you know, we, it is really eye-opening going into some of these very remote regions, uh, having the opportunity to interact and talk talk with these market participants directly and really understand what are the true challenges that they are facing and how we can help them. And uh, through the research, um, uh, we have made a number of uh, impacting practice. Uh, first of all, we work with the local government, uh, state government of Karnataka, to help them do the very first systematic impact assessment of a statewide platform that they, they have deployed um, to help 
uh, improve efficiency of these agricultural markets, uh, which I will uh, provide more details uh, uh, later. And through this impact assessment, we're able to make several important policy recommendations for the government in terms of how we can further improve the efficiency of this platform as well as the impact of this platform. And of course, uh, uh, this comes with a number of high visibility publications uh, as well as working papers. And I would say that uh, most importantly, we were able to work very closely with the government to Im implement some of the interventions and solutions that we de developed together in the local markets and drive material benefit to uh, the smallholder farmers in the state. Now, just to give you uh, what, uh, more details of the uh, of this project in Karnataka. So historical. So this is a map of uh, the Karnataka state in India, and each of these red dot is a local physical agricultural market. So historically, agricultural trades. So these are trades from farmers to the first layer of the supply chain, the, the first layer of the middleman. All right, so in the state, uh, agricultural trades are regulated such that these trades must happen in one of these markets. Okay, so historically, these markets, are, uh, these uh, trades are very localized and, dis and separated, right, uh, due to you know the historical licensing structure that they were in place in the state. And so immediately you can see that there are about 160 uh, markets distributed across the entire state, and immediately you can see that this creates issues of isolation. Right. Farmers typically have access to one of these markets, and there are only a very small number of traders that are present in each of these markets. And so the farmers are really at the mercy of these local traders in terms of determining the prices that they can sell their products to. And of course, because nothing is being documented uh, and, the, and the trading process is extremely manual, uh, you can imagine that there are a lot of um, issues related to collusive behavior and, and, and low competition in the market that eventually hurt the farmer's position. And so in 2014, the state of Karnataka made this huge uh, statewide reform of building a unified market platform to digitally connect all of these physical markets and regulate all trades to be conducted on this single platform. And so the idea of the reform is that through that digital connection and documentation, one, it allows traders, regardless of their physical position, to be able to trade in, uh, for products that arrive in any of these red dots, these markets. And so this should increase competition on the buyer side and give farmers a, high, you know, a better uh, uh, pricing position. Secondly, by digitally document, uh, documenting the trading process, this also in increases transparency of price discovery. And so uh, this can empower farmers to make better decisions uh, because now they're able to look up price information and make judgment in terms of whether the prices that they receive uh, from the particular buyers are actually a fair price for their products. And, and, and in addition, since the, uh, uh, most of these trades are done uh, based on an auction mechanism, and now because the auctions are also properly documented, so there's less risk of collusive and coordinated, or co coordinated bidding that uh, uh, were you know, uh, suspected to hurt farmers' welfare in, in the historical isolated uh, transaction. So now these are all the premises of the platform, right? So the, uh, the government had a strong belief that this, this uh, should work. But of course, the question is whether it actually worked. And so our collaboration with the government had two stages. The very first stage is really to try to, try to help the government to understand what is the real impact of this platform. Have this platform really bring material benefit to the farmers in terms of improving their welfare, improving the revenue that they can gain by selling their products on the platform. And then based on that analysis, we actually identified there are rooms for, for, for improvement. So there are situations where the platform has not delivered the full potential benefit to the, to the uh, farmers. And so now by analyzing the underlying operations and supply chain processes associated with the trade, we were able to make recommendations and actually implement a new auction design uh, in one of the major markets which bring uh, material benefit. 
So to give even more details, so in the very first step when we do the impact assessment, this is what we observe. Right? Among the uh, six uh, major commodities that were traded uh, in these markets and that we analyzed, what we find is that for paddy, groundnut, and maize, uh, the platform, the initiation of the platform as compared to the historical isolated market transaction, indeed has significantly improved prices uh, gained by the farmers. Um, and this actually is a quite substantial gain uh, uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the farmers by having the platform to digitally connect all the markets. But at the same time, we also find that for a number of other commodities, most notably for uh, lentils, uh, which is also a very major type of commodities in, 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 uh, in the state and also in broadly in India's context, that the platform has not delivered any significant price benefit for the farmers. By now drilling into why that happens and understanding the operational and supply chain aspect of lentils trading in this market, um, what we find is that this lentils market are oftentimes very far apart from each other. And so it imposes a huge logistical cost for traders who want to participate in cross market trading. Now remember, the premise of the platform to help the farmer is to attract traders from not physically in, in, the, in the market to also trade in that market. But because of the logistical uh, burden, we observe, that, we observe from the data that very few traders actually participate in uh, cross-market trading. And so essentially, the prices realized in any particular market is still quite dominated by the uh, local traders that are present in that market. And then in addition, because there's still a, very, a relatively small number of these local traders in those markets, and so there's limited in-market competition among these traders, and so the establishment of the platform has not really uh, delivered the benefit that, it, that the government has hypothesized it, it, uh, it could do. And realizing that, uh, one of the interventions that we propose is that we could try to optimize and change the auction design, particularly for lentils product in these markets, to induce more competitive bidding behavior of the traders. And this could in turn help to improve the price position for the farmers. Now, of course, theoretically, this sound, sounds great, but to make it real and, and, and actually implement it, it's a long process. So, and, 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 and this process, we have to be really mindful of the local cultural, behavioral, and practical conditions. Uh, in particular, we start the process by really doing a very deep dive operational feasibility study. Because to, in, in order to identify what are even the auction mechanisms or, or designs that are, uh, that are practically feasible, operationally feasible to implement in this market. So we need to consider how, whether we can get buy-in from the traders, whether we can get buy-in from the farmers, whether we can buy, get buy-in from the Monday officials or the market officials. And also we need to appreciate resource constraints of the local government because you know, they, they have limited resources in making changes on these platforms and they also need to ensure that the transition or implementation is as smooth as possible and not to disrupt the daily transactions that are happening on these markets. And so through that process, we identify some potential mechanisms. Now the next step is, now we need to understand how traders might actually change their bidding behavior once the new auction format is being deployed. Because any changes that we bring to this market is going to affect the livelihood of thousands of millions of farmers that depend on the trading on these markets uh, for their livelihood. And so we took, um, a, 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 we did very extensive field interviews with the major traders in these markets to really understand how they would change their, their bidding strategies when we change the market, uh, change the auction mechanism. And then combined with a, a, an auction model, then we were able to actually identify conditions as related to the types of products, the types of markets that these new auction uh, mechanisms is um, 
expected to improve revenue for the farmers. And that's when we gain sufficient confidence that we can then roll out the implementation uh, in one of the major markets and then utilizing the post-implementation data to now do another uh, impact assessment on the impact of the new auction. And so to be more uh, 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 precise, so the traditional design is a first price sub bid auction. This is an auction where you know, all the traders submit the bids for the lots that they want to purchase and the highest bid bidder is declared to be the winner. So that's the traditional. The new auction format that we introduced is a small change to this new, uh, this first price to bid auction into a two stage auction by introducing a qualification round. What they do is that in the first stage, they still submit that uh, uh, seal bid to the lots that they are interested in purchasing. At the end of the first round, we restrict that only top K bidders will qualify for the second round. And these top K bidders will also be informed of what is the current highest bid on the lots that they qualify for. And then in the second round, which is a much shorter time frame for uh, bidding again, these qualified bidders can change their bid. But the rule is that they cannot reduce and they can only bid at least as much as the current highest bid. Of course, they can outbid if they really want to win the, the lot. And then at the end of the second round, that highest bidder will um, be declared as the winner. And so, um, we implemented this two stage, new two-stage auction um, in uh, one of the major markets for one of the uh, uh, Lentos commodity tour in February of 2019. Here, let me show you uh, the impact of this implementation. So the vertical dash line is when we implemented the new auction in the treatment market, which is the darker curve. Um, and the yellow curve is a comparable market we use as a control market for our impact assessment. Uh, what we are plotting here is the average weekly prices in the two markets for um, about 20 weeks. So before the, two, before the dash line, both markets were using the traditional first price subit auction. And you see that the price curves move in a very parallel fashion. So, after the implementation, what we see is that the price gap between the two markets actually enlarges. And then through statistical analysis, what we show is that these correspond to about 3.6% of increase in average weekly prices in the treatment market because of the use of the two-stage auction as compared to the traditional uh, first price subit auction. Um, and this actually represents 3.6 might sound small, but in that context, it actually represents a very significant improvement in terms of livelihood and income for the farmers that trade in the, uh, under the new auction format in the, uh, in the treatment market. And we actually keep collecting data post implementation and what, and, and what is uh, encouraging is that we find that this effect is not short lived. It actually is persistent in, the, uh, in future season, selling seasons. And so the government is quite happy with, uh, uh, with this uh, implementation and they are you know, uh, eager to roll this out to other commodities and other markets as well. So uh, in the last, uh, couple minutes, um, I would like to also shift a little bit more uh, to the east, uh, in, still in the Asia uh, region, but now to the southeast uh, region of, of, of Asia to, uh, to talk a little bit about a, a current project that we are working on in, uh, fo with a focus in Indonesia. And this project has a particular focus on environmental uh, sustainability. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these smallholder uh, supply chains often coexist with the most threatened landscape, such as uh, a tropical rainforest. And this is a, a, this is a very typical uh, figure uh, you would see in these regions where these uh, plantations erode large areas of a tropical rainforest. Uh, because these farmers need to find land to grow uh, those commodities to sell and make a living uh, to support their family. Um, but at the same time, uh, there's also data showing that about 20% of humanity's annual carbon emission can be sequestered if we can promote large scale adoption of sustainable uh, uh, farming practices. And so again, this presents a, an opportunity where if we can motivate these smallholder producers, where traditionally maybe 
adopting non-sustainable, uh, non-environmentally sustainable uh, practices to adopt these sustainable practices, we can then achieve the dual benefit of stopping their, the, the, their ne the negative impact on the environment where they, they, their plantations are located, but also at the same time start to uh, uh, enable carbon sequestration uh, with this more sustainable uh, practices. And so that is really one of the projects that we are working on right now. And so this, is, um, this effort is actually based on uh, past efforts where we have uh, worked on developing platform technologies as well as the associated market design to really digitize and optimize the first mile of the supply chains and provide unprecedented visibility into that first mile. And this allows us a very scalable approach to, uh, to traceability. Now we can know where these, uh, where this, in this particular case, we focus on oil palm farmers. So for the very first time, we now have visibility into the very region of the oil palm production, which, uh, which oil palm comes from, uh, which farmers in the region. And this can help us to uh, enable implementation of incentives to now promote sustainability practices or to ensure quality of production. And so one of the current effort that we are working on is designing carbon reward schemes to actually motivate these oil palm farmers to engage in um, uh, peatland uh, conservation. So peatland is a, peatland conservation is essentially a, a very major effort that we're uh, being pursued in the region uh, in order to uh, you know, mitigate carbon emissions in the region. And so, uh, again, just you know, uh, like all the other projects that we have shared so far, this is, again, a very much on the ground uh, uh, project and effort. Uh, we have been working with or developing a relationship with local organizations, again, in Indonesia, um, and then also working with um, uh, expertise in uh, the science and engineering disciplines to help us design the proper interventions for peatland conservation on, uh, in, for oil palm plantations in Indonesia. And we are hoping that you know, we can initiate the project and the pilot experiment experimentation later in the year. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to uh, Resef to conclude. Yeah, so, uh, but by the way, the picture here is uh, Joan de Zegger, one of our faculty. Um, okay, so um, just to um, um, conclude here, I, I, I hope it was interesting, but I also want to uh, uh, point out that we have some uh, quite ambitious uh, plans uh, to try and launch some more efforts and increase and expand the footprint of the initiative, both in geographies as well as in terms of scope. And if you are interested to support us, uh, and engage with us, uh, we would welcome that very much. So um, um, one thing that we are currently working on is a major effort that is uh, uh, in Thailand, but more broadly in South Asia, uh, building on some of the current activities that we have, but we have uh, some uh, promising opportunities to start thinking about uh, issues related to the region. Um, one of them is related to the issue around water, major issue in Thailand, but also in the region, both in terms of uh, scarcity, floods, and other uh, both uh, impact on both environment and, and agriculture supply chains. Uh, we are um, still hoping to um, uh, expand even further our work in China. And finally, uh, we have a major um, plan to uh, think strategically about um, the efforts in the U.S., the policy efforts in the U.S. to increase the increased consumption of uh, fruits and vegetables and healthy food among uh, poor households uh, and people that live in um, uh, food deserts. And really here, the, the key issue is to think about how data can inform uh, operationalization of personalization of these programs that currently are not personalized. Uh, we also want to think about, in conjunction to that, of how we actually reduce the food waste in the U.S. It's a major problem. Uh, so again, hopefully that kind of leaves you with some sense of what we are planning to do uh, as well. And this is just um, three examples of other ideas that we have. And if you are interested to engage with us, we are, uh, we're going to be very um, um, responsive. Thank you very much, everybody, for your attention today. And I'm happy, uh, together with Karen, to take some questions. Thank you.
Hello. Hello. I have two questions, one for Professor Levy and one for Dr. Tseng. The data that you showed, how do you take into account the biases in the data, right? Because you have millions of databases that are muddled with recency, corrupt practices, entry errors, et cetera. How do you take that, that into account? Because conclusions can change, depends on that. G great question. So first, uh, no data is perfect, uh, um, uh, at least other than the exercises that you do in class. But like in real life, the, <laughs> the data is not perfect, uh, are not perfect. But uh, I think we, we've done a lot of work, and that's actually something uh, that I think we don't emphasize and teach enough, of understanding how the data is created and uh, that allow us to uh, see where the biases could exist and how to uh, account for them. It's not perfect. Uh, I can also tell you that we have robust mechanisms when we, cre when we actually maintain this data set to understand anomalies and changes over time, and then we can investigate. But one of the advantages is that we have collaborators on the ground, so it's not just looking at the data as a black box. We, we can actually go and ask questions and understand what have changed potentially uh, uh, in the underlying processes. Thank you. My question for Dr. Zhang. Um, the experiment that you did in India, it's as much as a data experiment as a social experiment as well, right? Uh, when you say that 3% increase in price leads to a 50 to 94% increase in profits, you know where the money is going, right? But I assume that the existing infrastructure is not going to stay like that, right? So they want to reclaim that process back again, or the money back again. Do you see the social aspect of it come back and hamper your efforts in actually improving the welfare of the agricultural itself, right? Do you see the, currently the people in power wanting to grab back the power and say, I'm not going to give any more of the money? Yeah, so I, I think, so definitely a uh, very, you know, insightful question about this not being just a technology experiment, but a, a very social experiment. And that's why, you know, we emphasize a lot in terms of understanding behavior and the cultural conditions locally when implementing some of these interventions. Um, and, and that's also why it's extremely important for uh, us, as well as our uh, local government collaborator, to understand the trader aspect and to get trader buy-in when they roll out this uh, new uh, format. And so, uh, so through our discussion with the traders, what they, what they feel is that you know, these Yes, on the margin, it, on the surface, it seems that the margin reduced, but it actually allows them to be more efficient in terms of tr their trading, because now they become more selective in terms of how they target which of the products that they would like to engage in auction with. Because now they know that it, they need to be more competitive in order to win the auctions that they really want. And so one of the things that I didn't really highlight here is that there are quality differentiation of these products that come to the market, right? And so previously, Traders may be broadly bidding on any kinds of quality without really thinking about what is the quality that they want, that they can sell a good price to their downstream buyers. And now they're actually, in, since the change, they're now engaging in a more thoughtful process that in that way. And, and this actually leads us to see that the major price increase is actually targeted toward the higher quality commodities. Because now, you know, they're more, more focused bidding from the traders in, uh, in buying these higher quality commodities. So I believe that there is going to be opportunities for win-win in the, in, the, in the supply chain. Uh, but of course, it requires also much more longer term research, which we are doing right now, to really see what is the overall welfare right, throughout the entire supply chain. Here we talk about farmer, because that's the immediate data that we can collect. But we are also looking at the downstream, potential downstream impact of these changes in the upstream of the supply chain. And, and one of our colleagues, it's actually a very insightful question because the assumption would be, hey, if you save, if you give more revenue to the farmers, then the traders are worse off. But uh, the research that Joanne did actually suggests that, and those of you that took operations management classes, you know that the one thing that uh, screws suppliers or traders is uncertainty. So these platforms, if you are able to reduce uncertainty to those suppliers, that's going to be something that will allow them to reduce their cost. And therefore, they might actually have to pay more. But overall, it's going to be beneficial for them. So um, yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yes.
but <laughs> I, I happen to be a Qing farmer. So I'm just, in your China um, experience, how do you trade off between sustainable uh, production, and, uh, which is, you know, results in usually higher unit cost, and, and mass production, which is usually lower units cost, which is important for fighting poverty in these countries, but it's, at the same time is neg negatively impacts the climate and also is probably has a higher correlation with virus outbreaks. Yeah, so again, th th these are interesting qu uh, questions. So I, I think that uh, in China, there was some kind of uh, shift or trend or idea to shift to industrial farms. Um, in, I think Karen um, did some research but, but there are uh, on this, but the, the, the challenges that you see there is first, the current land rules in China makes it very hard to create large farms. And the other thing is that unlike the US where the large farms are located in relatively sparse populated uh, regions, in China the agriculture is really uh, suited in very highly dense populated uh, regions. And, and there to create a large farms is not necessarily something very wise uh, because you can actually create pollution to the environment that, uh, that interact with the health of human. Uh, in fact, there are some studies that you see a lot of residual anti antibiotics in, the, in, in children in China when you actually test them and uh, some, some serious health damage. Um, I think that the potential more practical approach in China is how to organize these farmers together and make them work still as they're on their small lots, but in a more organized and protective way and more efficient way. And Karen kind of is doing a lot of research about the contracting schemes and how they can affect that. So I, I, I personally believe that that's a much more practical approach for China and potentially other developing countries. And it, it really brings that, that you cannot just sit in the US, look on what is happening in the US, say, oh, you should do that. That's a very, very arrogant and actually impractical approach. You need to really adapt solutions. There is no one size fit them all. You need to really understand the local conditions and adapt the solutions accordingly. I'll just add to that because this is very related to what we are doing right now in Indonesia, right? Because I think that a lot of this um, system, when you s say lower unit cost, it's really the, the time frame that you're thinking about, right? So if you're thinking about the immediate tangible cost of this season, maybe it's lower unit cost, but you're not uh, incorporating the exter externality that going forward in the future, right? So this could be your soil is degraded, it be you, you become become less fertile, it affects your productivity going forward. So I think a lot of the, the, the times when, even, even in the US, right, in the US agricultural system, uh, a lot of companies are really thinking just the immediate short-term cost and be very cost efficiency driven in that way. But once you start to internalize the longer term cost, it actually, there is some, there's some scientific studies shows that regenerative agriculture, farmers that adopt regenerative agricultural practices, in the long run, the average cost is not, as, is not higher than the traditional industrial farming uh, models. Uh, it's just because the industrial farming model, you didn't internalize all these other costs, right, of the disposal of the waste and all of these other things. Um, and so I think that it, 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 it needs a mindset shift and it also needs a shift in terms of how we think about objectives uh, when we make some of these decisions. And I think this is both applied to developing countries but also to the US. Um, and, and so in the projects in Indonesia, one of the things that, I think one of the challenges for regenerative agriculture or large-scale large adoption of regenerative agriculture is the upfront investment, especially when we think about resource-constrained smallholder producers. And so one of the things that we have been analyzing when designing the, uh, the incentive structure is how we can provide sufficient upfront subsidy or, or help to kickstart the process and then gradually over time, we can actually reduce that investment and let the system actually uh, self-sustain itself. And so, so I think that there's a lot of promises here and definitely not restrict to China or any developed countries. And I think US agriculture has a lot to learn uh, in that aspect too. With that, thank you again, everybody, uh, for your attention and sorry for going over time. Thank you.